And I don't know if it will show up on your screen or not, but I'm going to pin myself. So for me, I will be the only one up first and then I will uh, bring you in. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One last thing. It's Kasim Abdu. I'm sorry. Um, just you can uh, middle like you can skip the middle name. You're, oh, okay. So Kashgar. Uh, Kasim Kashgar. Yes. Kasim. Kasim. Okay. Kasim. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I want to. No, no, no. It's all fine. Um, in in many ways, like in, in many cases, people pronounce it Kasim, but then actually it's Kasim. So Kasim. I usually yes. Kashgar. Yes. Kashgar. Let me make sure I get it right then. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> you know, this is the old American phrase of uh, you can say anything you want about me in print, just spell my name right. Well, this is broadcast, <laughs> so let's say the name right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Dan Kabisky, Vice Chair of the Society of Professional Journalists International Community. With me today is Kasim Kashgar, who is a correspondent at uh, Voice of America. But more importantly, he's also the subject of an excellent short documentary called From Fear to Freedom, A Uyghur's Journey. Um, this is available on, I'm sorry, I got to. Yeah, no problem. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to do three things at once and it, and it didn't work. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's, it's I, all I meant to add you and not, mm -hmm. um, so let me just, let me restart it again. It was going great. I was, I was actually, in, yeah, intuitively listening. Just need to remove your pin. There you go. And now, there. Okay. Hi, I'm Dan Kabisky, co chair of the Society of Professional Journalists International Community. With me today is Kasim Kashgar, who is a correspondent at Voice of America. But for purposes of this discussion, he is also the subject of an excellent. Uh, documentary uh, on Voice of America, From Fear to Freedom, A Uyghur's Journey. Kasim, thank you very much for, for being here today for this IC talk. Um, thank you, Dan. It's my great um, privilege and honor to be with you. Okay, so um, the opening of the documentary is a dream you had in a graveyard trying to find your your grandmother's uh, tomb. It was a very emotional uh, moment. And you discovered you couldn't find it because you weren't there, because you had to leave Xinjiang for your own safety and the safety of, uh, of your family. Now, I would imagine there are many, many others um, who also had to leave their countries, who share those, those feelings, uh, the safety for their own safety and the safety of the family. Could you just talk about some of the stress and the emotions that went through your decision to leave? And then finally, what you and your family went through once you did leave? Um, thank you, Dan, for asking this question. Um, it, well, well, for anyone who, let's say, who grows up in a in a in a space in a place where uh, that person belongs or feels um, that person belongs to a place, um, usually they don't want to leave that place because it it smells, it feels, it 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 is their place to live in, and it it felt the same for me, but um, when I came to the conclusion that I had to leave because of my safety, it was unbearable because people were being um, getting arrested and I was constantly being interrogated as I, as I mentioned in the documentary. So I had to leave, but even without telling my loved ones that I was leaving, 
I told them that I was uh, on a short trip. And I, I told my grandmother um, when I uh, last saw her in 2017 in May. And I told her that I would, I would be back. And when she was dying in 2019, um, after three years, or two years, um, actually, when I had left, um, her last word was my name. And it was unbearable. And um, it wasn't only my grandmother. Um, I had lost um, at least um, seven um, relatives since I had left. And I, I wasn't able to even communicate with them freely um, in the past almost six years. And this being cut off from your country, your your family, um, you had you had a wife, your wife, and one child at the time, I I believe. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and I, you do yes. mention in the in the documentary, you didn't tell them you weren't coming back until you were on the plane. How? How were the dynamics in the family uh, at, at, at this point? Um, well, sometimes it's, it's better to not tell others the bad news um, before it gets worse. So I decided to not tell my wife while we were actually um, leaving the, the, um, uh, the border because uh, it, I, I feared that my wife wouldn't be able to handle it correctly and that we would be stopped maybe um, and would not be able to leave um, successfully. So I didn't tell her. Well, my daughter was then two years old. Um, she didn't understand um, the intricacy of the problem. And uh, well, the rest of the family, we, we had to leave them um, back home and I didn't tell them because if they even knew that would be um, criminal on their part later if the government if the Chinese authorities um, find out okay. and and so you you started out uh, I believe in uh, the Arab, Arab Emirates um, and then to Turkey and then eventually, uh, to the to the United States. Now there are when you when you left, you were not a journalist. You were not a working journalist. No. But um, there are many journalists. There are many people in our profession now who have had to leave their countries because their lives were in under uh, threat as well. Uh, I think of many of our colleagues from Nicaragua and and Venezuela in in particular. Uh, you you talked in the movie a bit about you were hoping that the school that you had established would continue to be able to to send you funds, but the Chinese government cut that source out. How did you survive? Uh, what was your source of, of funding while you were, in, you know, in the various countries, you know, event, and eventually ending up here in the U.S.? Um, I had, well, well, I, di I didn't have that much money um, when I came to, when we came to the U.S. Um, in May of 2017, um, we had less than um, 50000 U.S. dollars um, altogether. And well, when I said I didn't have much, well, that's a lot in terms of when you see like, oh, that's 50,000. That's, that's almost one person's maybe a yearly income, but without any um, uh, salary or any income source, uh, well, that 50,000 just uh, dries away very quickly. And um, so I when we came, I had to decide whether to continue my study at that culinary school in New York or um, start anew. Um, but I, I chose in the letter because, well, as you just mentioned, I didn't have any um, income source. I didn't have that opportunity. So I'm, we moved to uh, uh, DMV area, um, DC, around DC, um, particularly uh, 
um, Virginia, Arlington um, County. And um, uh, I rented a space, uh, an apartment, and uh, we started our life. And I had to figure out what to do, but I wasn't able to work until I got my um, work authorization permit. I had to, to wait at least over six months to, to get that in the mail. Um, so finally, when I got that in 2018 of July, July of 2018, I just went out. And the first place that I went in was a Domino's Pizza near where I lived. And I asked the manager, hey, do you guys uh, need a, a driver um, for delivery um, service? They said, yes, we're looking. We're, we're hiring, actually. Oh, that, and then I'm the person. I showed him my work authorization, and he asked me to uh, fill in the application, and I did. And then uh, he started, like, he asked me what, what days I was going to work. Um, I, I was actually studying for real estate license while I was waiting for my work authorization. So I didn't, I told him that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm studying uh, for something so I can come in the evenings. So I worked in the evenings, like six to eight hours every, every evening. And uh, well, because I, I my, my fund, as I said, the, the money that we had all, already almost was drying up and I had to, I had to we had to survive. And uh, I was working as a delivery driver. Well, the, the, there were two reasons for that. It was an easy job to find. And second thing, I wanted to learn the, like, the hard way, the American culture, the tipping. Because I've, I've taught my students that Americans tip, but I've never experienced that. But through delivering pizzas, I, I got the joy of being tipped, actually. So now, I mean, whenever, wherever I go to a service place, I would usually make sure that I, I do tip. And I know the feelings of a person who provides you a service. And I, I, I had amazing, great experience. It was hard, it was difficult. I remember getting my first paycheck. Uh, it wasn't even, I mean, in, in survival mode. I mean, I couldn't pay rent with that job, I, I found out. And second thing I, I started doing after two months of delivering pizza, I, um, I started working for a ride sharing company. And that was another, um, another job that I thought that, hey, I could, I could do it while I'm studying because I had a bigger goal of doing something bigger, um, not just delivering pizzas or delivering people to their <laughs> next destination. I, I, um, I worked for that Lyft um, or the, the Lyft uh, ride-sharing service because Uber didn't accept me because I didn't have a one-year driving license history in, in the U.S. So uh, I was happy that Lyft was uh, accepting that. And uh, I, was, I was driving since, I think it was end of September of 2018. And then one day in December 2018, I... I accidentally canceled one request, one ride request. I had never canceled a ride request, but I canceled it. And I was like, why did I cancel it? I mean, I did, I did something wrong. I, I, I never canceled a ride request. I would always keep my record good. But then after just a few seconds, I got another request and I accepted that. And it was from Reagan National to DC, to a DC hotel. So I got a I got a mature man um, on my, uh, uh, in my car and we were um, talking and he asked me well, what state I was born in. I said, no, I wasn't born in a state. I'm, I'm an alien, but a legal alien. I just made a joke like the, the song in, in uh, uh, the, 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 well, there's my, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite songs from a band called Sting. It's, it, it's called, I'm an Englishman in New York. I'm, in, I'm a Uyghur man in <laughs> D.C. I, I just made a joke. But uh, he, he, he got interested in, in, in me, in, in my story. So I briefly uh, told him uh, my past and what happened to my people and me and then how I ended up in, uh, in this place. And then he asked me one question at the end of that ride. He said, what is your dream? I said, I want to tell 
what happened to the world. And I want to work towards that bigger goal. Like I want to actually find bigger audience. He said like, oh, you're like, you speak five languages and you're, you're a good, a good source for a journalism work. Like, did, did, are you interested in that? Oh, that's exactly what I dream about. He said, send me your resume. Um, I'm meeting a, uh, a friend of mine, an executive at uh, Voice of America, and, I'm, and, and I see you are like, you're more than a right person. And I would highly recommend you to my friend tomorrow. Um, I'm having a lunch with him. I was like, okay, I'll do that. And he gave me his business card. And I, I, I sent him first thing when I went home, I made sure that I didn't have a resume, but I, I did prepare one. And I made sure that I sent him to his address. I, I, he didn't send me like he received my resume or anything, but I, I like from that conversation, I, I had some feeling that he was very pretty serious about his suggestion or advice. So like after a week or so, I, while I was driving for another um, customer, <laughs> I got a phone call, a, a DC number. And then um, I, I asked my customer, hey, this is an important number. I thought that something was happening. Maybe I'm getting a call from Voice of America. So I stopped and I got the call. And it was uh, a news editor from Voice of America asking me to for an interview, in-person interview. So I went there. I went to Voice of America two times. And then after probably two weeks of that, like all, all the interviews and all the tests and everything, um, I got another phone call congratulating me that I got the job. And that was January of 2019. And, and um, I had to wait for four months to get the job because at that time the government shutdown happened. <laughs> oh, right. And I had to wait. I had to wait until May of 2019. And from then on, it was history that I've, been, I've become a uh, Voice of America journalist. Well, you, you took away one of my, my set questions. How did you hook up with Voice of America? But I do want to do the, 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 you know, what has to be the most you know, common follow-up to anybody in your situation. Has there, ha, have there been repercussions against your family, against your friends uh, in Xinjiang uh, because you are working for Voice of America? This is a great question, Dan. Um, and th this was the question that I had to answer when I was interviewed, when I got the job. And I had to uh, actually answer to my uh, news editors, uh, supervisors. I told them that there is this repression against uh, the Uyghur diaspora, even if they are outside of China. And that's been happening uh, for many years. And I said that if there is any possibility that I could use a pen name, not my real name, to, to at least be able to kind of uh, stay away from that um, repression, transnational repression. And they said, yes, there is an opportunity that I could use a pen name. So I chose a name closer to mine, not Kasim, but Asim, not Kashgar, but Kashgarian, and my name as my pen name. But that didn't save, um, that didn't actually prevent or protect me um, at the end. Um, in 2021, almost two years after I, I began working for Voice of America, I get this uh, WeChat call from an old friend. And I was happy because it, it, it was an old friend from, uh, from my hometown of Urumqi, the capital city of the Uyghur Autonomous Region. And that, that old friend said um, that uh, the, the Chinese security, um, one of the chiefs of, of the regional um, uh, ministry of security um, wanted to be friends with me. Hmm. And and the reason for that was that they already found out what I do and they could do anything in exchange for becoming friends. And I was, well, I, I couldn't 
say like I was only angry. So there, there, there should be a, a better word for that. I was infuriated. I was, I was out of words. And um, I, I usually, I, I don't like swearing words. Well, nobody likes, I guess, I believe. But I, I started swearing um, words against the ones who requested my befriendship. And um, it was March of 2021. 20, uh, and then in, in two months, I get my sources tells me that at least 12 of my former employees gets arrested. Wow. And, and then in May, that friend calls again. And then he, he again tells me that, hey, how about now? I said, I found out that people got arrested. They should release them immediately. And you couldn't find, well, don't, don't never expect me to be friends. I'm a lawful person. And in the US, I cannot be friend with anyone from Chinese MSS. Yeah, wow. And, and well, it's, it's, it's a part of the story. And that, that, that transnational repression is happening until like even, even to this day, like a week ago, the, this, this is a real story. On Facebook, someone um, greets me riding in Uyghur saying, uh, usually, because I used to be a teacher, English language teacher for almost two decades. And I had a lot of students who learned English from me. So they, uh, so in, in that Facebook uh, messenger message, that person said, uh, called me uh, a, a teacher. So that's, that's like a professor. Uh, that, that's, and uh, with my name. And assuming, I assumed that he was a former student, but then at the end of the, the, his message, he said that he was going to Kashgar, a, a city I was born, and my last name, so that if he could add me um, on my WeChat, I said, okay, in China, nobody could use Messenger, it's banned, and how could you use I, well first first thing was okay this is not my student this is somebody so I, I asked him like who, who he was exactly what was his name what was the um what's his uh why he's reaching out to me uh what's his motive behind this message and um and how he could use messenger he said he used vpn and he said like oh i will uh tell you when I get back to Urumqi, the capital city of the region. I didn't say any word. And then after a few days, he said, oh, I'm in Urumqi. Um, can I talk? I said, sure. You didn't tell me who you are. But, and then he said, oh, we met during your, in your wedding in 2014. And uh, I, I well, I gave you uh, a gift in your wedding, if you remember, it was 2000 RMB, uh, the, the Chinese um, currency. Um, and do you remember me? I said, no, I don't remember. I, I didn't take any money directly from anyone in my wedding, um, first of all. And I, I said, okay, I don't remember. Tell me why you're asking. Oh, he said like, if you could remember, uh, I, I, I would uh, tell you more. I was like, okay, get off. So this is, this is like one small, wow. okay. So the one small example, there are many um, that, that's been going on. So the, there are, um, it's, it's, it's like, for me, it's, it's like daily meal. Wow. Um, we're running uh, short on time. So just a couple of minutes though, you, you mentioned that it took you six months to uh, get your uh, status changed so that you could work. Yes. Uh, could you maybe just give us your impression of the process of, you know, 
being able to get into the U.S. and then getting your status adjusted so that you can work. Because there are many, many of our colleagues in journalism who can't work as journalists because they're having problems getting their status adjusted, even though they're here as refugees, you know, to to save their lives. Uh, just mm -hmm. get, kind of get your impression of what, what went on there. Um, in my case, I, I came, uh, well, on a visa for as, as, a, as a student. So my, my goal was to be a student here. But then after, like, after a few weeks of, of actually being in the U.S., I found out that I, was, I wasn't able to continue my, my dream of studying here. But then I, I, I had to look for other, other options. So I found out that there is this asylum system in the U.S. Well, I've heard about it, but then when your life becomes so difficult, you had to find ways to, to, to adopt, adapt. And I, I, I found that asylum system actually works in my case because I could actually apply for asylum while um, in the US. So I did apply for that. And then I, well, I talked to a lawyer uh, who worked on many other Uyghur cases. So he was experienced in that. And I applied, it was December of 2017. And at that time there was a backlog, uh, backlog they call it, uh, that a lot of uh, asylum seekers or refugees were waiting to be there, um, waiting to, uh, for their uh, cases to be, to be resolved. So I was one of them. Uh, and I had to wait, well, it, it was seven months exactly, to get my work authorization document. That, that document only allows you to work legally in the U.S. for two years. Mm. Each time you get it, it's for two years. So I, had, I, I, had, I got it, and then um, with that, uh, you could actually work legally. But it depends on where you work. Uh, some jobs actually require you to be U.S. citizen, and some jobs require you to be a permanent resident, a resident of the U.S. And some jobs don't. In my case, uh, Voice of America, like when I came, I came as a as a contractor, as an outside, like third party. Like I I was hired through a third party. But then that changed in October of 2019. Um, it, it, it's called, at Voice of America, it's called um, per, uh, PSC, Personal Service Contractors. But it's, so Voice of America directly hires you, not through a third party. But um, in my case, uh, in my job, uh, actually Voice of America didn't require me to be a permanent resident of the US or a US citizen. But now I'm actually, because I, last year I, I passed my interview, I had to wait for um, almost five years for my um, asylum interview. So I had to change um, three times of that work authorization. I, I had to apply. And then, well, the difficulty was that each year you have, you have to renew your driver's license. So you have to visit the DMV. And, and it's a lot of headache. And you have to wait for... Um, well, it's, it's a long story. It's, it's a lot of headache because you dream of becoming at least a permanent resident so that your, your nightmares <laughs> of uh, going to places with so many paperwork. <laughs> um, uh, just it's finish. the U.S. government. Paperwork is important. <laughs> yes. But um, finally, I, I, was, uh, I, I got my uh, asylum interview uh, processed. And then um, and now I'm waiting for my uh, green card in the mail, hopefully, <laughs> in the matter of a few weeks. Well, congratulations. I mean, it, I've, we've worked through this process with friends, and so it's not simple. Congratulations yes. on coming to the finish line. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. Why don't I just wrap this up? Uh, yeah. Is there any last thoughts that you would have that you might want to want want to give about the trials and the tribulations of having again having to leave your home country, 
and having to establish your and all the work that you had to go through to establish yourself um, in another country. And can you do it in about two minutes? <laughs> um, okay, so. Yeah. Okay, can, can you ask that question one more time? I want to. I want to focus more on on like I. I don't want to. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, I, I want you to. Um, you went through a lot of trauma to make the decision to leave your country. Uh, you went through uh, a lot of stress uh, af after you left. You know how? What are we going to do? You you had this dream of being a student at a particular school. Um, that didn't work. You had to go through a lot of process. Just the stress, the trauma uh, of, of that decision, and also knowing that you can't go back. Uh, do you have any thoughts uh, that you would just like to leave, uh, leave us with about that? And well, any thoughts on that? Um, well, on, 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 well, nobody wants to, to leave um, their loved ones and their, their home country. Um, I mean, for forever. But in my case, yes, a lot of people are, are, are well, they're, they're forced to do that. And there, there's a, a lot of stress attached to it. But my, um, my, in my experience, my um, suggestion to others who are experiencing the same trauma, I would say, don't wait for uh, uh, a survivor. Well, I mean, don't wait for a savior uh, for help you. In, in, in many cases, you have to actually work hard to do to achieve what you have to achieve. So it, in my own experience, I would I would uh, sum it up as okay. Um, so it, it's I do a lot of uh, like fitness exercise to keep my stress out of my body. So it, it doesn't require you to have a lot of money for that. It, it only requires like you have to have the body and will and determination to do that. And, and then the second thing is, it's, it's always speaking the truth, not adding or not subtracting anything to it. It's always telling the people or your audience in, in a journalist's case, the truth, the facts, and that actually makes, makes all the difference because people are watching you and they can actually differentiate what is and what is not. Thank you, Dan. Oh, well, th thank you very much, uh, Kasim. Um, we'll have this up on uh, YouTube uh, shortly. I'm sorry, I will cut that part out. Sure, but, sure. thanks. But thank you very much, uh, Kasim, very much for uh, your time. Uh, again, uh, Voice of America, uh, From Fear to Freedom, A Uyghur's uh, Journey. It's a short, well-done documentary. Uh, lots and lots of information packed into that very short uh, story. Uh, I would recommend it to everyone. The, li the link is at the uh, International Community's website. Again, Kasim, thank you very much for uh, taking time to be with us today. Dan, I, I really appreciate for um, for well, organizing this interview with me. And I, uh, I thank you a lot. I can't thank you, I mean, enough for this. Thank you.